Hey everybody, welcome to the Banner Leak. I'm John, as always, and we've made it! It's the final Guilds of Ravnica set review, and boy, these last two videos took way longer than I thought to do. There's a lot of gold cards in this set! But that should make it quite fun. So today we're gonna wrap up the gold uh, review with Golgari and Demir. Then we're gonna look at the small number of artifacts and the small number of lands. There's actually a lot of lands, but we don't have to talk about every single one. But without further ado, let's get started with the first Golgari card. We have Assassin's Trophy. If you heard about this card, Assassin's Trophy is black and green for an instant at rare. Destroy target permanent an opponent controls. Its controller may search their library for a basic land card, put it onto the battlefield, then shuffle their library. This is basically one of the best removal spells we've seen in years and years and years and years and years and years and years. This is Path to Exile except it costs one more mana, but it hits anything. It doesn't just hit a creature, it hits lands, it hits planeswalkers, artifacts, enchantments, hits anything you want it to hit, and your opponent gets a land. Oh, no, that's that's terrible. Yeah, this card is just incredible. It's, it's a flat-out A+. It's the best removal we've seen in a long time. It's a value pick, obviously. Uh, be careful on that value. It's a little bit inflated at the moment as a like slight... MTG Finance side note here. Cards are way too expensive at pre-release. They then get opened, supply massively increases, and they're going to drop like a rock. Over time, by which I mean a year or seven, this will go up like crazy for sure. But if you're expecting to pick this and immediately turn it around, A, good luck finding a seller, and B, <laughs> you need to find that seller immediately because it's going to go down, 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 down over the next uh, year or so. But that's neither here nor there. We're talking about limited. This is uh, fantastic. Like I said, it's an A+. It's the best removal we've ever seen. It's the best removal in the set. It's a value pick. Grab it. A+, for Assassin's Trophy. Up next is Charnel Troll. Charnel Troll is one black green for a creature troll at rare. It's a 4-4 with trample. At the beginning of your upkeep, exile a creature card from your graveyard. If you do, put a plus one, plus one counter on Charnel Troll. Otherwise, sacrifice it. Pay black, green, discard a creature card, put a plus one, plus one counter on Charnel Troll. This card is interesting. To 4-4 four, four, Trample for three, and assuming it lives through the first turn, it will be attacking on turn four as a 5-5 five, five Trample. That's, that's, that's a big, big boy. And in fact, you can and even may have to make it a 6-6 six, six by discarding a creature card in response to the uh, the triggered upkeep ability where it needs to exile a card. So that's another counter. So this actually could be a 6-6 six, six trample on turn 4. That's nutty. That's insane. Uh, I watched this card at the pre-release. -pre Adam had it, and he did some insane things with it. I think it got up to be like a 10-10 or 11-11, something like that. Uh, this card is just nutty. You do go a little bit all in. You know, you are discarding the creature cards that you could be casting instead just to put counters on this, but it is a literal, absolute, must-answer card. If they do, they're going to do it really fast, and you're going to be down, you know, one or two creature cards that you've discarded, which are going to hopefully fuel your undergrowth, etc. later. Maybe you can recur them, whatever. And, you know, sure, you're down, but whatever. You got some removal out of them, you got them to answer this, yada, yada, yada. If they don't answer it, They've taken, like, six damage followed by eight. So they're at six on, like, turn five? If they blocked, maybe they're at, like, ten-ish. This thing is nutty. I, I'm never, ever, ever not first picking this card and going in on it. I think it's fantastic. I think people are going to get a little bit too worst-case scenario mentality on this, which is uh, not the usual, but I think this card is great. I've got this at an A-. I think it's just a super, super, super good card. Next up is Erstwhile Trooper. Erstwhile Trooper is one black green for a creature zombie soldier at common. It's a 2-2. Discard a creature card. Erstwhile Trooper gets plus two, plus two, and gains trample until end of turn. Activate this ability only once each turn. Which is sad, because this was very similar to... Uh, uh, Erebos' Emissary in Theros, where you could discard creatures to get plus two, plus two as many times as you wanted, and it was an amazing finisher in Limited sometimes. Uh, you just had to assume your opponent had a handful of creatures, and that thing was getting plus ten, plus ten. As is, though, this is fine. 
It's a it's a two two for three, which is slightly over costed, but you get to discard a creature for free, which will help fuel your charnel troll. It'll help fuel fuel your undergrowth, um, etc. So plus two plus two, it's gonna attack like a four four some amount of the time if you can. It's okay. It, it's it's like a C plus. I think it's a low C plus, but we'll go with a C plus on it for eternal troops. Up next is Golgari's rare split card, Find and Finality. Find is Golgari, Golgari, so black, black, green, green, or black and a green. For a sorcery at rare, return up to two target creature cards from your graveyard to your hand. We talk about this effect every single set, and every single time I have to say that I don't super care for this effect. I prefer this effect to be cheaper or attached to a creature like a grave digger or something spending a card on bringing back the creatures is something that i'm just kind of i'm slightly more towards the cut it more than you play it sort of mentality i would prefer to just play more creatures rather than return creatures yes sometimes you get to return your bomb but many 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 times you don't and so the card is very variable in how good those cards are that you're bringing back and paying black black or paying green green if i'm not in golgari it's not super worth it for me for this half of the card so if i'm not golgari i'm neither here nor there this is a typical like macabre waltz or whatever or whatever you want to call it and i've got it at like a c minus the other half, Finality, is four black green for a sorcery at rare. You may put two plus one plus one counters on a creature you control. Then all creatures get minus four minus four until end of turn. Well, the mere existence of this half of the card means that if I'm in Golgari, that other half of the card becomes good. It becomes a card that I would want to play because now we have the modal spell. Now if it makes sense for me to bring back my two gigantic bombs that I somehow drafted and are now in the graveyard. Cool, I can cast Find. And if it makes more sense to cast Finality, I can cast Finality. Now, the thing is that Finality is another of these board wraths that are slightly conditional that make me kind of go, eh, that's not terribly how I like to play limited magic. I want to be a little bit more proactive rather than reactive, and wraths are definitely reactive this one helps out a little bit because you can still play creatures and you you know if you have a, a, a three three down you can put the two counters on it and it's going to survive this wrath which makes this a little bit more like that concept turk here one dune blast or whatever it was where you pick a creature and then everything else dies uh and that was really good because that was a wrath that you didn't have to play around you didn't have to stop playing magic and let your opponent continue playing magic um so this is probably just totally fine it's probably like a B minus in my books. Some people are definitely going to go higher on it because a lot of people do like Wraths more than I do. But I'm at like a B minus on this card if you're in Golgari. If you're not just playing Find, I I'm not as huge a fan of that. I've got it at C minus in that situation. Up next is Glowspore Shaman. Glowspore Shaman is black green for a creature elf shaman at uncommon. It's a 3-1. When Glowspore Shaman enters the battlefield, put the top three cards of your library into your graveyard. You may put a land card from your graveyard on top of your library. So I guess, luckily, you don't have to. You don't have to just give up your next draw step to a land, which is not something I terribly want to be doing. And it's a 3-1 for two... Which, you know, I, I I like three ones for two more than I should, but it's a little bit harder to cast, being that it's black green as opposed to, you know, one in a black or one in a green or something. But I don't I don't know. Like this fuels your undergrowth, sure. So if I did have, you know, some really big payoffs and desperately wanted things in my graveyard, yeah, I'd play this for sure. But in an average Golgari deck, I don't think I really like this card. I think it's hard to cast. It's a three one. And the the upside of turning off my next draw step, I don't like it. I don't like it. I've got this at like a D plus. I think I'm just going to cut it almost all the time. So D plus for Glow Spore Shaman. Up next is Golgari Find Broker. Golgari Find Broker is black, black, green, green for a creature elf shaman at uncommon. It's a 3-4. When Golgari Find Broker enters the battlefield, return target permanent card from your graveyard to your hand. Well, here we go. Here's Gravedigger. Here, here's what I was just talking about with Find. I don't like the ability by itself, but when it's attached to something else... Totally fine. Totally solid. Uh, yeah, this card's great. It, it's very much like a Gravedigger. It's the same casting cost. CMC. 
as a grave digger. Obviously, black, black, green, green means it's not quite grave digger. You are never splashing this card, and you are rarely going to play this on turn four. But turn five, turn six, you're starting to get pretty realistic that you can cast it there. Um, yeah, this, this is just solid. It's a three, four for four. It, it's going to return a, a permanent. So rarely it's going to be better than grave digger because you get back that artifact that you really wanted. I don't think there's any that I would really want. Or you get back that planeswalker. You get back that Vraska that they killed, and then, then they're going to be really sad. Um, yeah, Golgari Fine Broker just looks great. I've got it at like a, a B, I think. Obviously, it has to be in the Golgari deck. And I think a big question of the format is going to be where do you pick these cards? Do you pick these cards early because they're so good? Or do you pick them later because there's such a big commitment that you can't commit to them that early? I don't know where I fall on that one, uh, but I'm going to go with a B on this, assuming that you're in Golgari. It's just a solid card. Up next is Izoni Thousand Eyed. Izoni Thousand Eyed is two black, black, green, green for a legendary creature elf shaman at rare. It's a two, three. It's got undergrowth when Izoni Thousand Eyed enters the battlefield, create a 1-1 black and green insect creature token for each creature card in your graveyard. Pay black and a green, sacrifice another creature, you gain one life, and you draw a card. Izoni is interesting. It's six mana, and it's obviously impossible to cast if you're not in Golgari, uh, but uh, sometimes it's a six mana 2-3 which is unplayable, and then it's a 3-4, which is unplayable, and then it's a 4-5, which is getting better, I guess. By the time we hit 5-6, so we get three 1-1s, one there's three creatures in the yard. That's that's a bit better. And then you can sack those 1-1s one that aren't going to be doing anything on turn 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, when this finally comes down, to gain a life and draw a card. And that's nifty, I, I guess. So, I don't know. I, I think a Zoni Thousand Eyed takes a massive amount of setup and work here to get some 1-1s one that aren't going to do anything, and then they let you draw cards. I, I don't know. I, I don't think a Zoni's all that good. I, I think she actually looks like mediocre, I guess. Um, there's just so much work to put into her to make her actually actively, you know, good, good. I, I guess at the fail state on turn six, you know, I talk about how people overestimate how many creatures are going to be in the graveyard without actively attempting. But on turn six, there's probably still going to be at least a couple. So you are getting a couple of one ones, which means you are going to get a couple of card draws. So this is probably ultimately fine, but I do have this low. I have this at like a C plus, I think. There's just so much work involved in this to actually make it actively good. So I'm going to go C plus on a Zoni Thousand Eyed, and I have a feeling I'm just going to never pick her because people are going to pick her higher than I am. Um, I don't know. I don't know, man. It, it, it's too late in the game. It, it's not quite impactful enough. C plus for me. Up next is Molder Hulk. Molder Hulk is seven black green for a creature fungus zombie. Add on common. It's a six six. It's got undergrowth. This spell costs one less to cast for each creature card in your graveyard. When Molder Hulk enters the battlefield, return target land card from your graveyard to the battlefield. So I guess the, the the intention here is to massively mill yourself, throw away everything you possibly can, lands get mixed into that, and then you get yourself a, you know, hopefully three or four discounted 6-6 six, six with absolutely no abilities, and then you get a land back on the battlefield, which, you know, we've talked about this before, ramping on turn five, six, seven, that's not ramping. There's no point to that. Uh, this just looks mediocre. I've got this at a C minus. It doesn't do anything. It's a six, six with no abilities, no trample, no evasion. And, you know, don't fool yourself. Don't think that you're just going to, you know, snap, get seven creatures in the graveyard on turn three. That's not gonna happen you're, you're typically not gonna get that much of a discount on this before you could just cast it or before you could just cast a vanilla 6-6 six, six. Uh, I've got this as a C minus I, I don't think I really want to be playing Molder Hulk give it trample give it something and uh, I'd be far 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 more interested up next is Okran Assassin. Okran Assassin is one black green for a creature elf assassin it on common it's a 1-1 one, one with death touch all creatures able to block Okran Assassin do so. This, this I like. This I like a lot. Like I said in M19 with Declare Dominance, you cannot ignore lure effects. They end games. Especially a wide Selesnia deck splashing for this with like Inspiring Unicorn or something. Game is over. 
This is way more powerful than it looks. If you haven't experienced lure effects before, lure being all creatures have to block this one, they are super powerful. In a pinch, if you're not ending the game, because she has death touch, you can also just, uh, you know, slam this in, slam your team in for good measure if you, if you can survive a crackback, and you get to kill whatever you want because everything has to block her, assuming it's untapped, assuming it doesn't have first strike or something. Um, and, and yeah, you just get to kill whatever you want for three mana. So yeah, I really like Okran Assassin. I think she's quite a high pick. I've got her at a B. Um, it, and, and again, this is a typical B combat creature. This isn't bomby. This isn't ending the game by itself. It's certainly going to be a reason the game ends, but it's not ending the game by itself. You do have to have the board state to go with it, have your opponent at a low enough life total, etc. But I think this card is just a B. Don't sleep on this card. Pitiless Gorgon is up next. Pitiless Gorgon is one Golgari Golgari, so one black black, one green green, or one black and green. For a creature Gorgon at common, it's a 2-2 with death touch. Ah, uh, yeah, we've got ourselves a, a Typhoid Rat, or a, a Hired Poisoner, as we saw back in the Black Set review, except it's way harder to cast for one extra point of damage. Um, this is infinitely worse than Hired Poisoner. A 1-1 one, one Death Touch for 1 is going to do almost always exactly the same thing that a 2-2 two, two Death Touch is going to do, except now we're paying three times the cost. Ultimately, it's still fine. Daggerback Basilisk was a 3-mana 2-2 two, two Death Touch, and it was fine, and this will be totally fine. You can play this. It's going to be like a C, maybe even C+, plus, but you would certainly just prefer the 1-1 one, one Death Touch for 1, because they're going to do the same thing 99% of the time. That 1% of the time, this is going to hold off a bunch of 1-1s, one, but that's about it. So, Pitiless Gorgon, just a, a solid, solid, solid C, maybe pushing on C+. Plus. Up next is Rhizome Lurcher. Rhizome Lurcher is two black green for a creature fungus zombie at common. It's a 2-2 with undergrowth. Rhizome Lurcher enters the battlefield with a number of plus one plus one counters on it equal to the number of creature cards in your graveyard. This obviously needs to be getting those counters. If it's a four mana 2-2, two, two, it's an F. It, it's an F minus. It's unplayable. If it's a 3-3 uh, three, three for four okay it's like a c minus at that point it's a uh, it's a hill giant you're going to cut it as much as you can and if you can get that second counter we've got ourselves a vanilla four for four i think ultimately the lurcher is going to be extremely deck dependent you're going to need to make sure that you do have some surveil you do have some self mill you're you're, you're you're definitely paying off that undergrowth trigger luckily that shouldn't be too much of a hassle but again this is just one of those cards where it's unplayably awful if you don't have the creatures in your graveyard and there are going to be situations where it's turn four and you have no creatures in the graveyard that's just going to happen you know the next few games of magic that you play today tomorrow whenever i, I guess arena is actually going down tomorrow so uh, maybe some of you won't be playing magic until the weekend count how many creatures are, are in your graveyard on turn four Typically, there's not many, if any. Obviously, Surveil will help that, and there's a little bit of self-mill to help that. But people overestimate, and I've said this a lot, this will be the last time I say it. Probably, maybe. We'll see how many more undergrowth cards there are for Golgari. You don't necessarily just have a gigantic stocked full graveyard. This isn't going to be a 6-6 six, six on turn 4. Hardly ever. So don't overestimate this. But I think as long as you are building around making undergrowth get paid off well, this could be like a C. Again, there's no trample. There's no evasion. There's nothing going on here. So I'm going to go C max. But uh, uh, yeah, make sure that you are paying this off. And personally, I'm probably going to cut it still quite a bit at a C minus level, just because I don't want this in my hand when it's a 2-2. And I don't really want it in my hand when it's a 3-3. So C minus for me for Rhizome Lurcher. C probably for everybody else. Up next is Status and Stature, the uncommon split card. Status is a single black or a single green for an instant at uncommon. Target creature gets plus one, plus one and gains death touch until end of turn. A totally fine combat trick. Totally fine. I, I would play this uh, at sort of like the C level, maybe even the C plus level in uh, every single black and or green deck that I'm in, just because it's going to be sort of combat speed removal, really. You're, you're, you're probably not going to make your creature live by giving plus one, plus one. And if it was going to live and kill a creature by giving it plus one, plus one, then the death touch doesn't matter. Realistically, you're using this on some little piddly creature that was going to chump block a big creature and surprise, they're going to trade. Fine combat trick. It's like a C plus. Statue 
It's pretty good. Statue is too black green for an instant at uncommon. Destroy target artifact, creature, or enchantment. Just poof. Gone. Uh, yeah, that, that, that's amazing. That is solid A removal. This is premium removal. Uh, before Assassin's Trophy was uh, revealed, I thought, wow, this is one of the better removal spells we've seen in a while in Limited. And uh, then Assassin's Trophy came along. But this is still fantastic. This is still a first pickable card. Obviously, it commits you a little bit to Golgari. You can still just splash this, though. You, you do just need a little bit of green or a little bit of black, and it's totally splashable. It's instant speed. It's unconditional. The rare opportunity where you use it against an enchantment or an artifact will be a, a nice upside. This card's great. It's a straight A for statue. I don't even care that status is on there. And in fact, you probably should be feeling pretty bad if you're casting status and you have this card in your deck. Uh, that's going to be like desperation. Uh-oh, emergency plan card. The, the plan is going to be casting statue. I think even if you're in a, uh, a not Golgari deck, you still probably should be splashing for the ability to cast statue a hundred percent of the time um so yeah just a straight a for status and statue super good card up next is swarm guild mage swarm guild mage is black green for a creature elf shaman and uncommon it's a two two pay four and a black and tap it creatures you control get plus one plus zero and gain menace until end of turn or you can pay one and a green and tap it to gain two life one of those abilities is a lot better than the other one. The uh, the Menace ability is just going to absolutely end games. If you are a little bit wide and suddenly all of your creatures demand two creatures to block, that could just be game over. But you are obviously telegraphing your plan well in advance by putting this down on two and saying, hey, just give me five or six or seven more turns and also a giant board state um but you know th th there's not too much that they can do to disrupt it i guess other than just killing the swarm guild mage actually um but yeah it it's a great ability it's just gonna utterly end games the other ability gaining two life i super don't care about it but the fact that it's only two mana if you've got two mana left at the end of your opponent's turn why not gain yourself two life it's going to be totally fine it's just kind of gravy upside to the rest of this card being a 2-2 two, two for two and having a, a heck of a game ending ability there this is another good guild mage uh, i don't quite think i'm going to be first picking this guild mage like i will uh the is it one and the demir one that we'll see uh in just a little bit as well as probably the boros one for that matter um, but i've got this at like a b minus it's still very very good b minus for swarm guild mage up next is Undercity Uprising. Undercity Uprising is two black green for a sorcery at common. Creatures you control gain death touch until end of turn. Then target creature you control fights target creature you don't control. Giving my entire team death touch isn't something that I'm super excited about, especially not, well, definitely not at sorcery speed. At instant speed, it would be very cool. You, you could definitely blow out opponent uh, uh, doing that. But at sorcery speed, your opponent's going to have full information on making their blocks, and that's, that's less good. The, the good part here, obviously, is the fact that you're going to kill a creature. You're going to have one of your death touchers, probably the crappiest one you've got, fight their best creature and just kill it for four mana. So this kind of ends up being like not an expensive rabid bite because your creature probably isn't going to live because you're going to throw away your worst creature because it can kill whatever you want. So really, this is almost like a bone splinters. This is almost like a sacrifice a creature, kill a creature your opponent controls, which at four mana and sorcery speed... I'm not too sure how happy I am about that card. And as I said, giving Death Touch to your team, I mean, it's going to put your opponent in possibly an awkward spot, but it's not that awkward, and you are giving your opponent full information about this in the main phase before combat. I still think this is a fine card. I still think I'd probably play the first one 100% of the time, but I think it's at the C-plus level. I don't think it's unconditional removal. It requires work. It, it, it's definitely a far cry from statue or assassin's trophy or, or really any other removal in the set you've got to have a creature you've got to be willing to throw that creature away i don't know i've got it at a c plus i could be underrating it i doubt it's any higher than a b minus uh, but i'm going to start possibly slightly low at a c plus for undercity revolt up next is Underrealm Lich. Underrealm Lich is three black green for a creature zombie elf shaman at mythic. It's a four three. If you would draw a card, instead look at the top three cards of your library. Then put one into your hand and the rest into your graveyard. Pay four life. Underrealm Lich gains indestructible until end of turn. Tap it. 
This card's nutty. This card's real good. Uh, th this was played as well by Adam at the pre-pre-release, and it did some serious work. The card selection that you get just looking at the top three cards of your library every turn and taking the best one is incredible. The undergrowth fueling that happens here is insane. You will get undergrowth for a huge number. Paying four life to regenerate this means that it sticks around for a while. It can be a great blocker, and you can't even lose to this card. If you mill yourself out, this doesn't say when you draw a card. This says if you would draw a card instead, which means it replaces drawing a card. And if you're not drawing a card from the top of your library, you're not losing the game. So you can't even mill yourself out with Underrealm Lich. Now, if your opponent kills it and you've milled yourself out, well, next turn you are going to die. But yeah, this card's great. This card is super good. I'd be first picking it every single time I see it and then uh, going deep on undergrowth if I can. Uh, this card's just super good. It's a solid, solid, solid. Um, I guess I'm going to go A. I was going to say A minus, but no, it's just a solid A. It, it, it isn't quite balmy. You know, it, it doesn't have flying. It's not going to end the game that turn. So it is sort of more the traditional value style rare, but the value is nuts. So I'm going to go just to, for a solid A on Underrealm Lich. Up next is our second Planeswalker of the set, Vraska Golgari Queen. Vraska Golgari Queen is two black green for a legendary planeswalker Vraska at Mythic. She starts with four loyalty. For plus two, you may sacrifice another permanent. If you do, gain one life and draw a card. Minus three, destroy target non-land permanent with converted mana cost three or less. And minus nine, you get an emblem with whenever a creature you control deals combat damage to a player, that player loses the game. Vraska just looks totally solid. She's not busted. She doesn't just win the game. I, I mean, until the point where she literally does, but she'll get some serious value. Being a sack outlet is great. Getting some cards in life for those sacks, including those extraneous lands that you have left over that you no longer need is great, especially with it being a plus two. The removal is pretty narrow for sure, but that just keeps her from being one of those stupidly busted planeswalkers. And then that ultimate It'll take some turns to get there, but suddenly your opponent is so close to death every turn. An easy first pick, not an A-plus Planeswalker, but I think she's a solid A. And that's it for Golgari, which means it's time to move on to the last guild, Demir, and then we'll do the artifacts and the lands. Up first for Demir is Artful Takedown. Artful Takedown is two blue-black for an instant, choose one or both, tap target creature, target creature gets minus two, minus four, until end of turn. Artful Takedown just looks totally solid. It's four mana. It'll probably kill something. It kills a massive amount of the format, and it taps something else. I'm sold. I'm not first picking this over, uh, you know, a similar monocolored card, but it still should be totally fine in Demir and probably even splashable in other decks if you're, uh, you know, a little bit desperate for removal and are okay with uh, off-color conditional removal. All in all, I think I'm at a B- minus on this. I think it's a very, very, very good card. Up next is Connive and Concoct. Connive is two Demir Demir, so two blue blue, two black black, or two blue black. For a sorcery, gain control of target creature with power two or less. That's very, very, very narrow, very, very, very low power. Sure, you'll, you know, potentially be able to grab an Aurelia, which would be nuts, but generally you're getting something pretty mediocre on this. Kind of like a defeat, though. Defeat was always sort of playable. That killed a, a, a creature with power two or less. This costs a lot more, and it's sorcery speed, but I think it's okay. I don't think I'd ever go out of my way to play it in a, uh, a non-Demir deck, but, of course, there's a second half of this spell. Concoct is three blue-black for a sorcery. Surveil three, then return a creature card from your graveyard straight to the battlefield. One of my favorite effects... Slightly more narrow because it has to come out of your graveyard and not anybody's graveyard, but it's still totally fine. You surveil three, which means you could potentially throw away a creature that looks really, really good, maybe even one that costs more than five mana, not that there's too, too many of those, and then get it back uh, without having to cast it, plus all the other surveil value that you got out of that. I think this is totally fine. I think it's like a B minus. It's not a bomb. It's not a game ender. It's just totally fine. And with Connive in the Demir deck, you know, if I have to use Connive, cool, but I'd prefer to use Concoct. So overall, B- minus for Connive Concoct. Up next is Darkblade Agent. Darkblade Agent is one blue-black for a creature human assassin at common. It's a 2-3. As long as you've surveilled this turn, Darkblade Agent has Death Touch, and whenever this creature deals combat damage to a player, you draw a card. That That's an ability that it gains. It doesn't also have that. 
This is totally fine. A 2-3 three for 3 is kind of like a C-, minus. but if you are in that surveil, surveil Matters deck, and by the way, there's way more Surveil than anything else. There's 22 common and uncommon Surveil cards. Mentor, Undergrowth, Convoke, Jumpstart, they all have 8 to 11 commons and uncommons. So there's a lot of surveil. So if you're in the surveil matters deck, I think this goes up quite a bit to like a B minus, uh, sort of great utility creature range. If you have incidental surveil, this is probably more around like the C, C plus range. So C, C plus up to B minus for Dark Blade Agent. Up next is Demir Spybug. Demir Spybug is blue black for a creature insect at uncommon. It's a 1 1 flying menace, and whenever you surveil, put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on Demir Spybug. This thing's really great. I, I really, really like it. 1-1 one, one Flyer. Well, <laughs> we've had some discussion about those, and this costs two mana, but it's got Menace, and that counter thing is huge. If you don't have that much Surveil, if you're expecting to maybe get like a counter or two onto this, maybe, then this is like a C maybe a C plus, maybe. Uh, but if you are Surveil Matters, if you have a whole bunch of Surveil and this thing can get, uh, you know, three counters or even more, then it's going to be super, super, super good. So if I'm in a heavy Surveil Demir deck, I've got this at like a B minus, maybe even just a solid B. If you're lower, it's, it's going to be lower. Surprise, surprise. Up next is Discovery and Dispersal. Discovery is one Demir, so one and a blue or one and a black for a sorcery. Surveil two, then draw a card. So it's preordained, but it costs two mana instead of one, and it surveils instead of scries. It's it's fine. If, if you're in blue or if you're in black, you might play this. It's kind of like an opt almost. You'll, you'll play it if you have a spot, and you won't if you won't. It's like a blue style of a combat trick. It has nothing to do with combat, but it's kind of that cuttable or playable level. Dispersal is three blue-black for an instant. This is one of the few, if not only, split cards where one half is a sorcery, the other is instant. Each opponent returns a non-land permanent they control with the highest converted mana cost among permanents they control to its owner's hand, then discards a card. This is really interesting we'll say it it sounds fine and typically i think the highest cmc creature is the one that you're going to want to be bouncing but it does really miss out on that counter value typically bouncing a counter is huge because it's a kill spell in that case but later in the game if your opponent is hellbent and you bounce the biggest thing in their uh, on their board to their hand and then force them to discard it it's like removal so i don't know i i think dispersal's probably less good overall than just targeted bounce because I could kill tokens. It wouldn't cost me five mana usually. Um, you, you really need to take advantage of that discard in order for it to have full value. You need to do this when your opponent's hellbent and you have no control over that. So I'm not super sold on dispersal being great. I think it's kind of like maybe a C plus, I guess. And discovery is just gravy attached onto dispersal. So, so I think the card is a C plus overall uh, if you are in Demir. If you're not in Demir, it drops down to like a C, C minus. Up next is Disinformation Campaign. Disinformation Campaign is one blue-black for an enchantment at Uncommon. When Disinformation Campaign enters the battlefield, you draw a card, and each opponent discards a card. Whenever you surveil, return Disinformation Campaign to its owner's hand. Okay, so this, so this is a an uncommon surveil matters payoff, but I think ultimately it's just too clunky. Getting half a divination and half a mind drop for three mana, that's not really a, a card that I want. And I've heard, I've, I've experienced a lot of people uh, lately, uh, somebody must have talked about this on a podcast or something, arguing that discard and drawing a card is exactly the same. You're up a card. If you want to reduce card advantage to extraordinarily basic math, then sure... But having your opponent discard a card of their choice and you having an extra option in your hand, an extra card that you shouldn't have otherwise, that's not equal. That, that's a huge difference there. I will take a card draw over an opponent, choose their discard any day of the week. Anyways, getting to recur this with Surveil isn't really what I want to be doing either. All in all, I think this is like a Surveil Matters trap card. I'm going to start pretty low on this. I've got this at like a D. There's just so many better things. Play a Demir Spy Bug, get some counters on it, and just kill your opponent. Don't don't dirtle around with this hoping that it works out. So I've got a D for Disinformation Campaign. Up next is a Trot of the Silencer. A Trot of the Silencer is two blue-black for a legendary creature vampire assassin at rare. She's a 3-5. A Trot of the Silencer can't be blocked. And this is one trigger. 
All of this happens. When Atrata deals combat damage to a player, exile target creature that player controls and put a hit counter on that card. That player loses the game if they own three or more exiled cards with hit counters on them. Atrata's owner shuffles Atrata into their library. The second she exiles a creature, she goes into your library. I misread this. A lot of people have misread this, that when the opponent loses the game, then she gets shuffled in. No, she gets shuffled in each and every single time. So this card is not the slam dunk A plus that I had given it originally. In fact, it's going to be pretty darn rare for anybody to win the game with Atrata in limited anyways, without multiple copies of her or bounce or, or something. But she is still just four mana removal. Now she is weaker removal. She's way weaker removal. Imagine if all of your removal spells not only could be countered by counter spells, but could be countered or at least temporarily delayed by bounce spells, could be countered by removal spells, could be countered by luminous bonds and capture spheres, etc. She is very uh, counterable removal. That's still super good. That's still super worth it, especially when the removal spell also says... Also, Lightning Bolt your opponent. Deal three damage to them. So Atrata's fine. I, I I would actually probably first pick her in a good number of packs unless there was just better removal in the pack. So I've got her at like a B. I think she's super good. I don't think you're ever going to win the game with her. And you have a, a, you know, a decent chance of just never seeing her again after you shuffle her away. But I, I think she's still really cool. And she's an alternate wing connection. So I've got to like her, right? B for Atrata the Silencer. Up next is House Guild Mage, my favorite guild mage. Blue black for a creature human wizard at uncommon. It's a 2-2. Pay one and a blue, tap it. Target creature doesn't untap during its controller's next untap step. Pay two and a black, tap it. Surveil two. So for one and a blue, you get to freeze a creature. You don't get to tap it. So it does already need to be tapped. Luckily, not only is there attacking, there's also convoking in this set. So there are many reasons why creatures will be tapped. And a freeze, a repeatable freeze for two mana is great. You could even potentially try to disincentivize your opponent from attacking just by casting this on a creature before combat. And then it could attack. But if it attacks, it's going to take a couple turns off. And for two and a black, surveil two to your heart's content. I mean, one a turn, but one a turn to your heart's content. That is amazing. The value on House Guild Mage is fantastic. I will super, super, super first pick House Guild Mages if the pack is uh, even slightly looking weak. I've got House Guild Mage at a solid B+. I think it's a great, great, great card. Awesome use of your mana. Just ugh, the existence of this card gives me high, high hopes for this format. Up next is Lazav the Multifarious. Lazav the Multifarious is blue-black for a legendary creature shapeshifter at Mythic. It's a 1-3. When Lazav the Multifarious enters the battlefield, surveil 1. Nothing special, but there's more. Pay X. Lazav the Multifarious becomes a copy of target creature card in your graveyard with converted mana cost, X, except its name is Lazav the Multifarious. It's legendary in addition to its other types, and it has this ability that we're currently talking about. Lazav looks really, really, really good. It's a 1-3 for 2 that surveils, which is pretty close to an Omen Speaker, close enough to just be fine there. Getting to clone dead or surveiled or milled cards, though, that's really nifty. Obviously, the power of Lazav does depend on how many big, bomby creatures you have, namely flyers. Luckily, there's an okay amount of those in blue and black. Unlike other clones, though, you're not going to be getting any ETB effects out of him, so don't go counting your ETB effects. He's, he's on the board. And then he shapeshifts, so that, that's not going to happen. You just want those beefy flyers to copy and things like that. Maybe things with good activated or, or static abilities. If you have enough, though, then this is a great card. I think its floor is like a B-, and its ceiling is way up around an A-. A as well as that, you can splash. You don't have to have this on turn two, and the activated ability is colorless, so you can easily splash this in your non demir blue or black decks. This is great. Uh, I'll first pick it every single time I see it. Uh, A- minus for Lazav the Multifarious. What's better than one Mythic? How about two? We've got Mnemonic Betrayal. Mnemonic Betrayal is one blue-black for a sorcery at Mythic. Exile all cards from all opponents' graveyards. You may cast those cards this turn, and you may spend mana as though it were mana of any type to cast those spells. At the beginning of the next end step, if any of those cards remained exiled, return them to their owner's battlefield. Exile Mnemonic Betrayal. I don't care for this card at all. 
Something you'll get from my set reviews time and time again, and something that I'll get yelled at about time and time again, is that I like consistency in Limited. I like cards that are going to do the same thing every time. They might be weaker than those cards that will, you know, four out of ten times just snap win the game, but six out of ten times not. I like consistency. This card is not consistent. I have zero control over how many and how good the spells are in my opponent's deck. I have zero control over if they have been cast yet. So I have literally no clue what this card's going to do for me game to game. Game two, game three, I have a slightly better idea, but I still don't know what's going to happen. Not only that, say there's an awesome five mana removal spell or something that I want to cast. That five mana removal spell is eight mana because I had to cast Mnemonic Betrayal. I don't like this card. I never, ever, ever, ever want to play this card. I have it at an F. I don't want to touch it. F for Mnemonic Betrayal. But you know what's not an F? Night Vale Predator. Night Vale Predator is blue, blue, black, black for a creature vampire at uncommon. It's a 3-3 flying death touch hex proof. This card is just stupid. It will be a scourge of the format. Uh, I talked about Hexproof a lot yesterday, so I'm not going to super reiterate that, but it is just, uh, it's uninteractive. It's massively difficult to deal with. The absolute, the only way that you can possibly deal with this is if you have a three power flyer. If you don't, you are just boned. You do not get to do anything about this card and that is bad magic they need to stop printing hexproof creatures that are this powerful it ruins limited it's an a minus it's first pickable despite that color commitment i've seen people saying it's super hard to cast it's not super hard to cast if you're a demir deck if you're a demir deck with no guild gates whatsoever you're still likely to get this starting on turn five. That's when it crosses over 50% likelihood that you're gonna have blue, blue, black, black. And if you throw in even a couple of guild gates, the odds go way up on turn four and turn five of you getting this. It's not that hard to cast. It's like a five drop or a six drop, which is about where this card should be. If it wasn't, you know, blue, blue, black, black, it would be like five and a black or six and a black preferably. But yeah, it's an A minus and it is uh, just a stupid card and it needs to go and the stupid hexproof horse it rode in on a minus for this card up next is notion rain notion rain is one blue black for a sorcery at common surveil two then draw two cards notion rain deals two damage to you like many other cards this is a theros card called read the bones but with surveil instead of scry and it's totally fine it's just totally fine it's like a c plus i i will probably play the first one the majority of the time that i'm in notion rain i'm not going to go super out of my way for the second one but if i've got one i got a spot cool it's not a high pick it's not a reason to go blue black you'll just be totally happy with it c plus for notion rain up next is thief of sanity thief of sanity is one blue black for a creature specter at rare it's a 2-2 flyer whenever thief of sanity deals combat damage to a player look at the top three cards of that player's library exile one of them face down then put the rest into their graveyard for as long as that card remains exiled which means thief of sanity can go away it doesn't have to be around anymore. You may look at it, you may cast it, and you may spend mana as though it were mana of any type to cast that spell. This card's great. I love it. It's like Night Vale Spectre from uh, original Return to Ravnica, or, or I guess maybe that was actually Gatecrash. Um, it might have been one of my favorite cards, actually, from that block, and this is a really cool version of it as well. 2-2 two, two Flyer for 3. I'd already play that, but the massive bonus of grabbing cards off the top to cast them? Absolutely awesome. A- minus for Thief of Sanity. Really love it. This might be one of my more favorite cards in the set. Up next is Thought Erasure. Thought Erasure is blue-black for a sorcery at Uncommon. Target opponent reveals their hand. You choose a non-land card from it. That player discards that card. Surveil 1. Even more Thoughtseize style effects, which I have talked a lot about so far in this set review. I don't like them. I, I, they're not good in limited. People take the fact that they are quite good in constructed and try to port that over to limited and they're just nowhere near as good. I much prefer them in the sideboard after I've seen something that I can't deal with, but there's a good chance that you can deal with most of the stuff that your opponent has. And, and typically there's going to be like one or two cards that you're going to be excited and actually actively want to thought seize out of their hand. So this is just not good enough at all. 
It's probably a little bit more playable in sealed just because your opponent has the chance of having more rares on average in sealed than they have in draft. Um, but really, this is a, a D. It's a sideboard only, very low pick. Up next is Unmoored Ego. Unmoored Ego is one blue black for a sorcery at rare. Choose a card name. Search target opponent's graveyard, hand, and library for up to four cards with that name and exile them. That player shuffles their library, then draws a card for each card exiled from their hand this way. This card's unplayable in limited. It is an F. It is un un playable. First up, you're not going to get full value out of this. Typically, people have one of every card in their deck. They'll rarely have multiples of a common, and even more rarely have multiples of an uncommon. Multiples of a rare? Well, that's like one in a hundred. Um, this, this just does not do anything. If there is a card that you are utterly terrified of, and I don't know what that would be offhand... You have to bring this into your deck. It takes up a card slot. You have to draw it and you have to play it before your opponent plays whatever that card is. I, I don't like Unmoored Ego. It, it's just way too narrow. And if you have it in your main deck, you don't even know what to name match one until you see it, at which point it's way too late. So I've got this at an F. I, I'm not going to play this out of the sideboard. I'm never going to pick it. It's just a bad limited card. Great stuff for Constructed bad for limited and our final demir card is whisper agent whisper agent is one blue black or blue black so one blue blue one black black or one blue and black for a creature human rogue at common it's a three two with flash and when whisper agent enters the battlefield surveil one uh looks great it's it's hired blade which we had an m19 except it has surveil on it that, that's fine this is a c plus it's at best a mid-pack pickup but i think you're totally fine with the first one c plus for whisper agent and with that we're done to mirror which means we're in the home stretch we've got artifacts and lands, so let's get it started up first we have the lockets we have boros locket demir locket selesnia locket golgari locket and is it locket all of these are three mana artifacts that you can tap to add red or white and you can pay uh guild mana guild mana guild mana guild mana mana so for Boros, you can play, pay red, 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 or white, 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 or red, red, white, white, or red, white, 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 or white, 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 and tap it and sacrifice it to draw two cards. These are okay. They're, they're better than the clue stones were in Dragon's Maze, first and foremost, because there's not 10 of them in a small set, which was a massive problem with the clue stones in that format as a whole. Uh, and these are just okay. If you need some ramp, they're going to be a good card. So I think realistically, you're most likely going to see these in Golgari and in uh, in Selesnya, where they're maybe going to want to cast some five, six, seven drops a little more, bit more common. I think the Boros one is probably the least likely to be played because Boros doesn't want to play this. This doesn't turn sideways and attack. Why, why would they play it? You can also use these as color fixing, but I would strongly prefer to use the guild gates rather than a locket because the guild gates are free, they're a land, etc., etc. But you know, a, a later in the game, when you've used up the splash color or whatever, or these are no longer relevant, sacking them for four mana is a lot, but you get two cards of it, out of it. It's a, it's a fine thing to do at the end of your opponent's turn after holding up some removal or something. All in all, these are fine. They're they're just like C's. There's not much else to say about them, and uh, if, if you don't need that fixing, if you don't need the ramp, just don't play them. Up next is Chamber Sentry. Chamber Sentry is X mana for an artifact creature construct at rare. It's a 0-0, zero, zero, but it does enter the battlefield with a plus one, plus one counter on it for each color of mana spent to cast it. Pay X and tap it. Remove X plus one, plus one counters from Chamber Sentry. It deals X damage to any target. Pay white, blue, black, red, green, return it from your graveyard to your hand. So realistically, this is gonna be a two, two for two, the vast, vast, vast majority of the time. Sometimes it'll be three, and I'm sure there are some wacky people out there who will try to make it four or five. But I'm gonna operate on the assumption that this is a huge amount of the time, a two, two for two. That's a C. That, that's fine. That's, that's, a, that's a playable bear. Um, but bears, of course, are slowly getting phased out if they don't have an upside. But this one does have an upside. You can pay two, tap it, and kill it, to deal two. That, that's still worse than Goblin Crater Maker, but it's still okay. And if you uh, don't want to shock something, you could kill an X1, and then next turn you could kill another X1. This does Mentor well and, and pumps itself up, so it works out quite decently in red-white. So there's a bunch that you can do with this, and I think all of the cool things that you can do with this ultimately still just makes it like a C+. It's not amazing, 
it's not amazing by any shape of the imagination. I think it's just a C plus. Uh, it's a rare that you're not going to want to see in your pack, but you're also not going to be at all sad about playing it. So C plus for Chamber Sentry. Up next is Chromatic Lantern. Chromatic Lantern is three generic mana for an artifact at rare land you control. Have tap add one mana of any color. Tap add one mana of any color. Uh, th that's an ability that Chromatic Lantern has, so it also taps for anything. So it basically turns your deck into a five color deck. If you have the lantern, don't pick up a lantern and say, haha, I'm five colors now. Because you still have to get the lantern. You may just not draw it. In fact, I would say odds are in any given game, you won't draw it you'll be slightly less likely to draw it than you will. So be very careful with this. But if you are splashing, and especially if you are three colors, then this card is just great because not only is it a mana lith, but it makes all of your lands mana liths. Um, so yeah, if you're splashing, this goes up in value to like a C plus, probably not really a B minus. But if you are just two colors there, there's no reason to touch this card. So keep that in mind. Up next is Gatekeeper Gargoyle. Gatekeeper Gargoyle is 6 generic mana for an artifact creature Gargoyle at on common. It's a 3-3 three, three flyer, but it does enter the battlefield with a plus one plus one counter on it for each gate you control. Another gate payoff, and I'm still not sold on them. So it's a 3-3 three, three flyer for 6. That's not good. I don't want that. If it comes in with a counter on it, we've got a 4-4 four, four flyer for 6, which isn't unheard of, but typically they have some pretty good abilities attached to them. This does not. If you have the second gate and it's a 5-5 five, five flyer for six, well then, we're totally fine at that point. But, uh, you know, what are the odds that you're gonna have two gates on the field by turn six? Or, you know, let's be generous and say turn eight, which frankly is a little bit too late, but let's go with it. With five gates in your deck, you just start to get over a 50% chance of having two of them or more in play by turn eight. That's That's not great so you need to have a ton of gates for this to be like a c plus and anything less it's a very cuttable c minus i think so c minus c plus for gargoyle guardians and i don't think it's worth putting all the gates in your deck just for that up next is glaive of the guild pact glaive of the guild pact is two generic mana for an artifact equipment at on common equipped creature gets plus one plus zero for each gate you control and has vigilance and menace equip cost of three expensive equip cost it only gives vigilance and menace if you uh you know if you don't have any of your gates down yet and as we just talked about you need a lot of gates to even guarantee getting the uh the the first one down let alone the second one so if you are not stacked up on gates you should absolutely period not play this ever double period i don't know what that does to a sentence but double period um you, you just don't play it if you have a ton of gates you probably still just don't play this just play a creature play 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 a play anything else other than this this card is a uh, the typical bad equipment of the set so d for glaive of the guild pact i don't care for it at all up next is Rampaging Monument. Rampaging Monument is four generic mana for an artifact creature cleric at uncommon. It's a zero zero with trample. That's weird, but it does enter the battlefield with three plus one plus one counters. And whenever you cast a multicolored spell, put a plus one plus one counter on Rampaging Monument. So we've got ourselves a hill giant. Four mana, three, three. That is a C minus. That, that is a C minus, period. But if you cast one multicolored spell, it becomes a four four for four, which is a total C. I, I don't think it would range up to a C plus, but a perfect vanilla passer uh, with trample though. So I think we can safely go up to C plus. Um, and then if it gets that second counter, it's a five, five trample for, that you paid four for, and that's great. And you're going to have hopefully a good amount of multicolored spells in your deck. I would expect the average deck to have at least six, seven, eight multicolored spells, possibly more, uh, especially if you're doing three colors. So this is, I think, just totally fine. And it's really the trample that saves this because it actually makes it really relevant. So I think this is at least a C plus, depending on how many multicolored spells you have in your deck and you're going to. Uh, I think it's actually going to be almost impossible to have a red white deck where my red cards are red and my white cards are red. You're, you're going to have some Boros cards in there. So I think this is a C plus kind of on the floor. And if then if you are heavily multicolored, Colored, this can jump up, I think, to a B minus. So C plus for Rampaging Monument. Up next is Silent Dart. Silent Dart is one generic mana for an artifact at uncommon. Pay four, tap it, and sacrifice it. It deals three damage to target creature. No. It's Explosive Apparatus, which I 
barely would begrudgingly play in most decks in most formats that it's been in. It's it's it's, it's always been sort of fine, but. I don't think you ever look at a deck and say, yep, this is one of the better decks I've built and it has explosive apparatuses in it. One more point of damage for one more mana? Uh, yeah, blah. It's it's too slow. It doesn't kill the threats that you actually care about on turn five when you can first activate this and your opponent knows it's coming, which is not the kind of removal that I really like. So Silent Dart, I think, is just aggressively mediocre. I think it's like a D plus. I, I, I think you should actively try to not play it. Uh, yeah, D plus for Silent Dart. And then our final artifact of the set is Wand of Vertebrae. Wand of Vertebrae is one generic mana for an artifact on common. Put the top card of your library into your graveyard. Pay two and tap it and exile it. Shuffle up to five target cards from your graveyard into your library. If you're Golgari and you really want to fill up your graveyard or for undergrowth, then this is a, a decent way. I was going to say pretty good. Let's not go that far. A decent way to do it. Getting to shuffle back five good cards when you're done fooling around is nice enough, but this is just really far off from how I like to play Magic. It's high variance. You could mill your bombs. You could mill your removal. You could just continuously not mill creatures for your undergrowth. And then when you crack this, all you do is you get a chance at drawing those cards that you just put back. I'm at a D on this. I, I don't think there's any decks that I want to play this. There's, there's better ways of enabling undergrowth. You're black if you're Golgari. You have access to surveil. Play surveil cards. Don't, don't play Wand of Vertebrae. So D for Wand of Vertebrae. And with that, we're going to move on to the lands, and there's not too much to talk about. Up first, we have the Guild Gates. We have Boros Guild Gate, Demir Guild Gate, Golgari Guild Gate, Izzet Guild Gate, and Selesnya Guild Gate, times two. There's actually two different arts for each one, which is pretty cool. They do replace the basic land slot in your pack, though. So it's not like you're going to be getting multiple Guild Gates per pack or anything like that. These are fine. We, we've talked about these a lot because there are the Gate Matters cards, and uh, I don't think ultimately any of the Gate Matters cards mattered to me. I, I think they're all way too weak for the uh, uh, the work and the luck that you have to put into them. But these are just great fixing. If you are a two-color deck other than Boros, I think you're pretty happy with the on-color Guild Gate, one or two or even three, especially if you have those uh, uh, XXYY four mana creatures, the, the blue, blue, black, black, for example. I think you really want guild gates. And if you're splashing, you really want off-color guild gates as well. Uh, guild gates are surprisingly good. They should be picked relatively highly in the pack. Generally not first pick or second or third. Around fourth, you sometimes might want to consider it, especially if you're going to go for deep splashes or three colors. Just be aware of the Boros guild gate. If you are Boros, you probably should be actively avoiding guild gates. They're tapped lands. You don't have time for tapped lands. You need your lands to come in untapped, your creatures to come down, and them to turn sideways. Not your lands. So anyways, these are, I don't know, like a C plus, I guess. It's really kind of hard to rate a dual land because some decks just won't care. Some decks actively don't want them. A lot of decks want them. Many decks require them. You'll know if you need these or not. That's all I can tell you. Up next is Gateway Plaza. Gateway Plaza is another gate at common. Gateway Plaza enters the battlefield tapped, as gates do. When Gateway Plaza enters the battlefield, sacrifice it unless you pay one. Tap, add one mana of any color. So it's a rupture spire that also says gate. It's okay okay but not great rupture spires never really been good um, if you're desperate for fixing and you didn't get the off color gate that would have worked better you could go with this if you're pushing like four or five color shenanigans this will help out a lot more it'll be like a chromatic lantern but a land um, but generally you shouldn't be playing this it's like a c minus uh, I, I would actively avoid playing this outside of four or five color shenanigans c minus for gateway plaza up next is Guildmage's Forum. Guildmage's Forum is a land at rare. Tap, add colorless to your mana pool. Pay one generic and tap it, add one mana of any color. If that mana is spent on multicolored creature spell, that creature enters the battlefield with an additional plus one, plus one counter on it. So it's a filter land. And if you use that filter mana on a creature, it gets a counter. I really don't know. You know, I really don't know about this card. I'm desperately going to have to play with this to figure out if it's like an F or if it's like a, a B 
be or, or where it is, and it's obviously going to be deck dependent. You're going to need to have a bunch of multicolored creatures or else just, this just is not paying you off. You're just hurting your mana base for this. So I don't know. I, I have to get my hands on it. My instinct is that it's just way too much work and that it's an F sort of in terms of deck building and drafting and should you play this card and should you attempt to build around this card, I think it's like an F. That does not mean that there aren't going to be decks where, you know, every color, every creature is a multicolored creature. And so every creature you're going to pay one extra mana for, and it's going to have one extra power and toughness, and that's going to be cool. But I think on average, I, I think generally, this is probably going to trend towards an F. Now, of course, I hear you say, but it fixes mana. It doesn't have to be used on the multicolored creatures. That's true, but there's so many better ways to fix mana. If this was a set without guild gates and shock lands and etc., sure. But this is a set with guild gates and shock lands and lockets and etc. So, no. And then finally, the last cards for this set are the shock lands that I just mentioned. Overgrown Tomb, Sacred Foundry, Steam Vents, Temple Garden, and Watery Grave. These are called shock lands because they enter the battlefield tapped unless you pay two life, in which case they do enter tapped. And they tap for blue or red in the case of steam vents, for example. Uh, they also have the land types of their colors. So steam vents is a land island mountain. Should you have a reason to go and fetch these somehow, you can do that. Um, I don't think there's anything that allows you to do that. Even that Selesnia card says a basic forest or plain, I believe. So that doesn't really matter in this set. Ultimately, these are gates that can enter on tapped, and they aren't gates for the gate matter cards. So realistically, quality wise, these are like a C plus. They're about the same power level as a gate ever so slightly better, but they're not a B minus. They're just a C plus. They are worth money. That amount will come way down. When these were in standard last time, they were all relatively cheap. I'm talking like five, six bucks, maybe. They will absolutely, over the next five, six, seven years, go up in value. But if you're looking to win a draft, you shouldn't be taking these very highly. So they're a C plus as far as the draft is concerned, and they're a V for some amount of value. So C plus or a V for the shock lands. And that finally wraps up the Guilds of Ravnica set review. This one took a lot longer than I thought. The uh, the, the mono-colored set reviews really sort of gave me a, a false sense of hope of how long these last two videos would take, and they took a lot longer. Um, but we've reached the end, and I'm super excited about this format. It's got my favorite archetype of blue-red spells in it. It doesn't look like it's ludicrously fast. I don't think Boros is going to be overwhelmingly aggressive and hard to deal with. I, I'm not sold on Mentor being something that you're just totally going to get to do every single turn multiple times. I don't think that's going to be the average way that Mentor works out, but I'm super excited for this set. I'm going to be playing a whole bunch of this starting on Wednesday. Wizards has invited me to a special streamer event on Magic Arena. They've given me access to a free account for the 24-hour period where I will have 100,000 gems to spend on draft and sealed. I'll have all the cards so I could build new standard decks, etc. So check out twitch.tv slash themanaleek. I'll be starting at 11 Eastern on Wednesday and playing for some large amount of time. I don't know exactly how long. And then, of course, there will be primer videos for the pre-release. There will be pre-release recaps. And then, of course, Spiky Saturday and other draft content will be Guilds of Ravnica starting the week after. As always, if you have any questions, comments, or suggestions, you can find me on Twitter at TheManaLeak. That's L-E-E-K, like the vegetable, not the card. You can find me at Facebook.com slash TheManaLeak, Twitch.tv slash TheManaLeak, and Patreon.com slash TheManaLeak. If you like the content, click that thumbs up button. Click subscribe if you want to see more. And if you do have questions, comments, or suggestions, let me know. Otherwise, see you all next time.